do things have to be this way? I'm sure that is the question everyone will be asking after the day of retribution is over. They will all be asking why. Indeed, why? That is the question I've had for everyone throughout all my years of suffering. Why was I condemned to live a life of misery and worthlessness while other men were able to experience the pleasures of sex and love with women? Why do things have to be this way? I ask all of you. All I ever wanted was to love women, and in turn to be loved by them back. Their behavior towards me has only earned my hatred, and rightfully so. I am the true victim in all of this. I am the good guy. Humanity struck me at first by condemning me to experience so much suffering. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I didn't start this war. I wasn't the one who struck first. But I will finish it by striking back. I will punish everyone, and it will be beautiful. Finally, at long last, I can show the world my true worth. The subject of today's video is Elliot Roger. It's a really fascinating case. It's a really disturbing case. And I think it's a really useful case for highlighting the fact that no matter how you raise a child or how good your intentions are, sometimes there is just no accounting for issues relating to mental health. This story is a real tragic one. It's also quite a long and in-depth one, and is my longest video to date, so... Grab a comfortable place, sit down, and uh, strap in. Elliot Roger was born in London to Peter Roger and Lee Chin a Malaysian-born nurse who had worked as a unit nurse on the set of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Peter also worked in film, directing television commercials and working on the hit film Hunger Games. At the age of five, Peter, Chin, Elliot and his little sister Georgia moved back to California. Those were the good years. It was really wondrous, those first four, five years of his life. It was wondrous. He was a really adorable, cute little boy, Peter Roger said. When Elliot was seven, Peter and Chin divorced. A year later, Peter remarried, this time to Sumaya Akabone, a Moroccan actress who had appeared in the Hollywood blockbuster Green Zone. It was also the year Elliot began his long journey with therapy. Elliot Rogers' rage began long before Santa Barbara shooting. Elliot had had problems. But they weren't things that I would consider overly worrisome, or that he would ever be a threat to himself, or he would be a threat to other people, his father said. Like a lot of kids, he wanted to be part of the cool crowd that had trouble fitting in. His parents moved him from school to school, trying to find a place where Elliot could succeed. His father said he had had very few friends in elementary school. He was quiet and shy. He also had a certain OCD about him, always putting his plate in the same place at the dinner table, always wearing the same clothes. There was a suggestion that Elliot might have had Asperger's syndrome, though he was never formally diagnosed. Elliot said in his journal that his rage began to build even as a youngster, as the son of a Hollywood insider with a front row seat to the entertainment industry's most powerful and glamorous. My little nine-year-old self realised there were hierarchies, that some people were better than others, 
Jealousy and envy, those are two feelings that would dominate my entire life and bring me immense pain, Elliot wrote. But Elliot hid that pain well, his father claims. If he were sitting here right now, you would think, what a polite boy he was, Peter Rogers said. But yet, he had this thing going on inside of him. Peter Rogers said he never had an inkling that his son harboured a lethal rage inside him. There's no way I thought that this boy could hurt a flea. He'd never, ever been violent or showed any violent tendencies, ever. Ever, he said. I think that his mind was taken over by a disease, his father has concluded. The lonely young boy had become an introverted teenager. By the age of 13, Elliot had walled himself into the fictional cyber world of World of Warcraft. His constant companions were the heroes and villains of the online fantasy game. In high school, Elliot was bullied, though his father said Elliot would never talk about it with him. There were incidents when food was thrown at him. Incidents when he was pushed into lockers. I was an innocent, scared little boy trapped in a jungle full of malicious predators and I was shown no mercy, he later wrote in his manifesto. He would leave two high schools before landing at the tiny 100 student Independence High. For all the things that Elliot had, the black BMW, the designer sunglasses, there was one thing that always eluded him. A girlfriend. And that became his obsession until the very end. I mean, look at me. I'm gorgeous, but you girls don't see it. I don't understand why you're so repulsed by me. Elliot stated in his retribution video, before his killing spree. Sex became an obsession and an agony for Elliot. Finding out about sex is one of the things that truly destroyed my entire life. Sex, the very word, fills me with hate. Elliot would write in his journal. I would always covet it. I would always fantasise about it but I would never get it. Peter Rogers said he tried to talk about this issue with his son, but chalked Elliot's nervousness about girls to normal teenage jitters. Of course you're going to find a girlfriend, Peter Roger would say. Of course you're going to fall in love. Of course you can have children. Elliot, there's no rush. I put it down to just straight, youthful jealousy. I didn't think that he was harbouring lusts of terrible deeds in his head. I didn't think he had a plan of revenge, or all of the stuff that came out, he told Barbara Walters. By the time Elliot reached his 18th birthday, the shy young boy had vanished, leaving behind only resentment and anger. Too terrified to approach young women, it was easier to hate them. Hi, Elliot Roger here. Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. Against all of you. For the last eight years of my life, ever since I've hit puberty, I've been forced to endure an existence of loneliness, rejection, and unfulfilled desires, all because girls have never been attracted to me. Girls gave their affection and sex and love to other men, but never to me. I'm 22 years old and I'm still a virgin. I've never even kissed a girl. I've been through college for two and a half years, more than that actually, and I'm still a virgin. It has been very torturous. College is the time when everyone experiences those things such as sex and fun and, and pleasure. But in those years I've had to rot in loneliness. It's not fair. You girls have never been attracted to me. 
I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. And yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men instead of me, the supreme gentleman. I will punish all of you for it. <laughs> On the day of retribution, I am going to enter the hottest sorority house of UCSB. And I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up, blonde slut I see inside there. All those girls that I've desired so much, they would have all rejected me and looked down upon me as an inferior man if I ever made a sexual advance towards them while they throw themselves at these obnoxious brutes I'll take great pleasure in slaughtering all of you you will finally see that I am in truth the superior one the true alpha male. <laughs> yes. After I've annihilated every single girl in the sorority house, I'll take to the streets of Isla Vista and slay every single person I see there. All those popular kids who live such lives of hedonistic pleasure while I've had to rot in loneliness for all these years. They've all looked down upon me every time I try to go out and join them. They've all treated me like a mouse. Well now, I will be a god compared to you. You will all be animals. You are animals, and I will slaughter you like animals. I'll be a god, exacting my retribution and all those who deserve it. And you do deserve it. Just for the crime of living a better life than me. All you popular kids. You've never accepted me. And now you'll all pay for it. And girls, all I've ever wanted was to love you and to be loved by you. I wanted a girlfriend. I've wanted sex, I've wanted love, affection, adoration. But you think I'm unworthy of it. Another incident happened on the following day near the same location. I went to the Starbucks at the Camino Rio Marketplace by myself like I usually did every morning. I ordered my coffee and sat down on one of their chairs to relax. A few moments later, when I looked up from my drink, I saw a young couple standing in line. The two of them were kissing, passionately. The boy looked like an obnoxious punk. He was tall and wore baggy pants. The girl was a pretty blonde. They looked like they were in the throes of passionate sexual attraction to each other, rubbing their bodies together and tongue kissing in front of everyone. I was absolutely livid with envious hatred. When they left the store, I followed them to their car and splashed my coffee all over them. The boy yelled at me, and quickly, I ran away in fear. I was panicking as I got into my car and drove off, shaking with rage-fueled excitement. I drove all the way to the Vons at the Fairview Plaza and spent three hours in my car trying to contain my tumultuous emotions. I had never struck back at my enemies before, and I felt a small sense of spiteful gratification for doing so. I hated them so much, even though I splashed them with my coffee, he was still the winner. He was going home to have passionate, heavenly sex with his beautiful girlfriend, and I was going home to my lonely room to sleep alone in my lonely bed. I had never felt so miserable and mistreated in my life. I cursed the world for condemning me to such suffering. 
So I think this is a really interesting change in Elliot Rogers' mental state. I think at this point there's no going back for him. And I think it's worth remembering what sort of person thinks like this. Now don't get me wrong, I have got all the time in the world for people who are struggling mentally. And believe me, um, I have been there. I can safely say that there are things that Elliot Rogers says that I can relate to and um, I've not read all his manifesto there are about 130 plus pages in that manifesto but I think you can safely say that there are some bits in it that I sympathise with and that I think he's got a point with I don't think that just because you've got a privileged upbringing, it means you automatically are a controlled, healthy person, mentally speaking. And I think this is a good example of that. But a lot of the things that he gets so upset about are just things that millions and billions of people have been through. He had all the means around him to get help and instead he didn't I think I showed earlier the pictures of um, uh, him at the beginning of the video at the Hunger Games premiere with his father he actually states in his manifesto that he really enjoys the fact that he's on one side of the curtain and the kind of the loser fans are on the other end and it's this kind of ego this prevailing attitude that he deserves more that I find so immensely frustrating. And I think these videos and the manifesto that we've re-recorded um, here are really indicative of that ego and that um, psychopathy. Um, he was a really scary individual and I think it, it goes to show that despite the therapy, he was still willing to do what he did. I mean, the rage and the anger he feels towards this couple and the assumptions he makes are just terrifying. He made a few more recordings and he wrote a bit more. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, put those out for you now. new housemates moved into my apartment for the autumn semester. They were two foreign Asian students who attended UCSB. These were the biggest nerds I had ever seen. They were both very ugly with annoying voices. My last two 
housemates Chris and John were nerds as well, but at least they were friendly and pleasant. These two new ones were utterly repulsive, and one of them had a very rebellious demeanor about him. He went out of his way to start arguments with me whenever I raised the issue of the noise he made. Hell, even living with Spencer was more pleasant than these two idiots. Hey, Elliot Roger here. I'm just sitting in my car right now, after watching that beautiful sunset descend beyond that hill up there. Enjoying a nice vanilla latte. Oh yeah, that's nice. Makes me feel all pumped up. I've been doing a lot of thinking about how sad and unfair my life has been. All because girls haven't been attracted to me. I've been going through college for two and a half years now. And in those two and a half years, I've had to rot in bleak and sad loneliness while other guys get to enjoy all the pleasures of, you know, sex and socializing and partying. I've never had a taste of that because no girls give me a chance. No girl at my college has ever expressed any interest in me. I mean, you give a chance to all these stupid, obnoxious guys that I see I see you walking with, but you don't give a chance to me. Why not? I'm, I'm such a magnificent guy. I'm beautiful. You can't deny that. I've traveled all over the world. I have so much to talk about. I'm civilized, intelligent, sophisticated. I have a sense of style. And yet you girls don't see it. And every single day, I have to be insulted by the sight of all these lesser men walking around with beautiful girls. I see so many couples where the guy is just so unworthy of having a beautiful girlfriend like that. And yet, they're together, he has her love, and I've never had any of that love and affection from girls. Why do you girls give those guys a chance, but not me? I deserve it more. It's, it's not fair. Every single day I have to be insulted by the sight of guys enjoying girls while I'm all alone. Even watching that sunset up there is a bittersweet experience because while I love the peaceful beauty of it, I can't help but think of all the other guys who get to enjoy that same sunset with a beautiful girlfriend at their side while I'm sitting here all alone in my car. There's no beautiful girl in that passenger seat to enjoy it with me. Because you girls have something against me, I don't know what it is. Whenever I drive through this college town called Isla Vista, which is just right next to UCSB, I see so many hot, beautiful blonde girls walking with absolute stupid, obnoxious-looking douchebags. And I just can't help but think how wrong that is. Those beautiful blonde girls should be walking with me. Not those brutes. I deserve them more. Why do those horrible men get to experience the love and affection of such beautiful, heavenly girls? Well, I've had to rot in loneliness all my life. It's not fair. 
It's such an injustice. I don't understand you girls. It's like... Your sexual attraction is flawed. It's perverted. You're attracted to the wrong kind of guy. You should be attracted to guys like me. Beautiful, magnificent guys. This world... It's so twisted. It's so cruel. And you girls make it cruel. You girls have starved me of sex and enjoyment and pleasure for my entire youth. You've taken eight years away from my life. Eight years I'll never get back. Do you know how much misery you've caused me? I'm such a nice guy, why won't you give me a chance? Okay, so this is where I completely lose any semblance of sympathy. There's no beautiful girl in that passenger seat to share my car with. How about rather than um, thinking about your car and your sunglasses and your money, you actually try and change your fucking brain. Or actually, um, you know, do something for them rather than think of yourself. Who cares that you're a virgin at 22? Who cares that no girls ever look at you? No one gives a shit. Doesn't that tell you that something might be wrong with you? Apparently not. So, so it is really difficult to feel sympathy at this point. And especially when he starts targeting, um, I appreciate it's in a journal that's intended to be private, but where he's targeting his roommates and sort of saying they're ugly and they're nerds and all of this sort of stuff. Um, no wonder no one wants to get to know him. It just, it beggars belief sometimes. Elliot Roger began his murderous rampage by stabbing his two housemates and another man to death on the evening of Friday the 23rd of May, 2014. The men he killed at his apartment were Wei Han Wang, 20, Cheng Yuan Hong, 20, and George Chen, 19. Following this, he drove to Starbucks and purchased a vanilla latte before uploading his final video online. Less than two hours later, at around 9.15pm, Roger arrived at the Alpha Phi sorority house. Rachel Glykes, who lived there, heard him pounding on the door for several minutes. No one answered, but after the pounding stopped, Glykes heard six to seven gunshots, a female scream followed by three additional gunshots. Vanessa Brist, another resident, heard the gunshots as she was getting dressed, according to the report, but thought at first that they were firecrackers. Linda Gordon, the sorority's house mother, gathered some of the other residents in a room to take shelter. Roger had returned to his car. Through its open window, he shot Veronica Weiss, Catherine Cooper and Bianca de Kock as they walked past the western wall of the sorority house. Then, making what one witness described as an aggressive turn from Embarcadero del Norte onto Segovia, Roger drove away. De Kock survived, Cooper and Weiss did not. This brought his total murders by this point to five. The first 911 call came in to the Santa Barbara County Dispatch Centre at 9.27pm from a man named Spencer. The Sheriff's Office broadcast a gunshots heard call less than 30 seconds later. Deputies, several of whom had heard the gunshots before running towards the house, converged on the scene. Roger was still driving. He made a three-point turn in a driveway on Pardle Road. As he passed a coffee shop on Pardle, he fired one round into it. It was closed at the time. A group of friends were standing on the corner outside the Ford Deli Mart when they heard a loud noise, which the report says was likely Roger's gunshot into the coffee shop. 
One of them suggested they go inside the deli, so they filed inside. Christopher Michaels Martinez turned to look at Roger's car from the doorway of the store. He was struck in the chest as Roger fired numerous gunshots into the store. Michaels Martinez fell to the floor inside the deli mart, where he died, giving Roger his last victim other than himself. Roger continued to drive, shooting from the car window near the junction of Embarcadero del Norte and Madrid Road. He swerved to hit a man, Jin Fu, who was crossing the road. The car struck Fu with such force, according to the report, that his body flipped as he was thrown into the air. Miraculously, Fu's only injury was a small bruise on his left calf. Roger continued to shoot at people, hitting and wounding several of them, as well as knocking several people over with his car. At 9.35pm, Roger crashed heavily into a parked car. Officers rushed to it. In the driver's seat, they found Roger. His black Sig Sauer pistol loaded and cocked next to his hip. He was dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The whole attack had taken around 8 minutes, according to the report, which estimates that 55 9mm rounds were fired. By the end, 14 people had been wounded, either by gunshot or by being struck by Roger's car, and six were dead, not including Roger. More than 500 live rounds of ammunition, another pistol and two knives were discovered inside the car by police. One of the people who was shot... Bailey Maples recalled that Roger had a creepy laugh, a laugh that would become unpleasantly familiar to investigators and the press in the following days as his online world began to be revealed. After his death, investigations found a wealth of evidence leading to suggestions of premeditation. Among this evidence are his YouTube uploads, as well as his manifesto, My Twisted World. He was also a member of an insidious online community on a message board site called puahate.com. My Twisted World had been emailed to several people, including his father, earlier that day. His father, Peter Roger, a film executive, told investigators the document freaked him out. In Roger's apartment, along with several more knives, including a 10-inch zombie killer fixed blade and an 18-inch machete, and a printout of his manifesto, was a diary. The final handwritten entry reads, This is it. In one hour, I will have my revenge on this cruel world. I hate you all. Die. In his introduction to his report, Sheriff Bill Brown says, Sadly, terrible crimes like this occur far too frequently. Brown wrote that in the aftermath of such tragedies, the question always asked is, what can be done to save lives by preventing similar crimes in the future? In California, we have some of the strongest gun control laws in the nation, yet in this case the suspect was still able to legally purchase and possess three handguns and hundreds and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, Brown wrote. Many suspects in mass murder incidents suffer from severe mental illness that is untreated or undertreated, yet in this instance the suspect was receiving treatment and had been since childhood. Nevertheless, he wrote, more can and must be done to ensure that those who died were not lost in vain. Now to another ABC News exclusive interview with Peter Roger. He is the father of Elliot Roger, the young man who killed six and wounded 13 in a shooting rampage near UC Santa Barbara last month. Barbara Walters is here with us sharing more from her revealing interview. We've never heard from a parent of a shooter. No, this is the first time that a parent of a shooter has, has spoken out. Uh, we sat down with Peter Roger for mm -hmm. an intense two-hour interview and he spoke very candidly about his struggles with his son Elliot for almost all of his son's life. He thought that his son might be suicidal, but he never thought that he would be homicidal. And by the way, he is the first parent to speak out on television. Uh, he feels it's his mission. So we'll take a look.
There have been numerous school shootings. None of the parents of other shooters have spoken with us. Why did you decide that you would speak up? The only reason I'm here is to tell his story to try and stop this happening again. How did you learn that your son was the shooter? I thought he was a victim, and it wasn't until 4.35 a.m. that I found out by going on the internet that he was the main suspect and there was only one killer. And when I saw that, it was like, it's, it's, it's one's worst nightmare. I, I can't describe the feelings. Mr. Roger Elliott was your son and he is dead. How do you mourn a child whom others vilify? It's very hard, Barbara. It's very, very hard. After reading the journal, I, uh, I had a lot of anger for him. And I think my job now is to try and replace that anger with love and forgiveness. But at the same time, I'm haunted by this disease, this human being that changed and became something else. The father of Adam Lanza now says that there are times he wishes his son had never been born. Do you ever feel that way? That's a really loaded question. Um, I, that's a loaded question, Barbara. A part of me says yes. And the reason is because he did an awful lot of harm to young men and young women who didn't deserve to die. And my son did it. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to share with you um, all the various details of his manifesto. But um, if you compare what he promises to do in it with what he ends up doing um, in the end, it's just really reminiscent of um, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris from Columbine. There, if you may or may not know about this, but their original intention was to bomb. Uh, Columbine School and the shooting was just a byproduct. Well, if you read Elliot Rogers' manifesto, his intention was to take it out on um, the sorority sisters of the Alpha Phi sorority um, to punish all the jocks in his uh, college and his campus, and that amounts to him murdering three Asian men in his apartment randomly shooting um, two girls and randomly shooting a guy and it's exactly the same as Dylan Claybold and Eric Harris who wanted to take it out um, on their entire school um, you know uh, population and instead just ended up randomly shooting some children in the library don't get me wrong this in no way dulls the impact of those deaths and my heart goes out to those people who have died in the most horrific ways but I just think that it just goes to show how completely illogical um, irrational and demented uh, it is to end up acting in this extremely extreme way I'm just going to reiterate something I said near the beginning of the video and that is that many things that happen are entirely preventable the scariest situations are ones that you just can't see coming the only person to blame here is Elliot Roger because of what he chose to do he can't help his mental state but he can help himself help his mental state and I don't think you could ever justify anything 
that he did. <laughs>